thank you all very much for coming to the Frontline Club this evening, where we're going to talk about Nigeria, violence, corruption, and oil. I wish sometimes when we talked about Nigeria, we didn't talk about violence, corruption, and oil, but we have to, because that is the reality. We have um, a very eminent and excellent panel. Uh, we're very sorry not to have with us the Archbishop of Joss. He, unfortunately, couldn't join us because of the volcanic ash, which I suppose you could say is an act of God. That's what the insurance companies say, but if God has intervened, he has in the, with um, Kataza Gondwe from Christian Solidarity Worldwide, who will be reading a short statement from the Archbishop and also be on our panel tonight. Um, we also have Jamila Tangaza, who's the head of the BBC Hausa Service, which, as many of you know, is extremely influential in Nigeria. And uh, three days ago, did an interview with um, General Babangida, um, which some people think may have sunk his presidential hopes forever. <laughs> so that's one of the things we're going to ask her to talk about, because it's so interesting. Michael Peel was um, Financial Times uh, correspondent in West Africa and um, wrote a book called A Swamp Full of Dollars about the, the Delta, and is still very much in touch with the area. And um, Abdul Rafu Mustafa, university lecturer in African politics and Kirk Green Fellow at St. Anthony's College, one of the most prestigious Oxford colleges. Um, why are, my um, what? So he's a late replacement to the yeah. panel. Oh, you, you're not. I've got the wrong person. Sorry. Africa you're Africa confidential now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Africa confidential. I didn't. I've introduced the wrong person. Say that again. Dukwa Salumanu. Dukwa Salumanu. Yeah. Let's think first of all why we are here. It's because Nigeria is back in the news again. Um, we've had killings in Jos twice this year, in January and in March. Uh, Nigeria has a president who, some people say, is not a president because he's dead. He's a president who we haven't seen since November, who's been ill, an acting president who was really only able to take up the reins of government within the last couple of weeks. Um, a smoldering crisis in the Delta as well, um, concern that um, that violence could break out there again, that the deals which were done to bring up a peace there might not um, might not last because of the instability and the void in government. So these are the issues we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to ask each of the speakers to speak for five minutes, seven minutes, and then um, there'll be an opportunity for comments and questions. From the from the floor, so I think I'm going to ask Jamila Tangaza first. Tell us a little bit about Joss. Tell us a little bit about that interview with Babangida. Start us off. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think perhaps the the, the 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 best way to start this is to is is by probably introducing uh, the BBC House of Service. Now, the BBC, very very briefly. BBC Answer Service has been in existence how many years there? What, 54 years? It's one of the 31 language services that the BBC broadcasts in. Um, we make content that goes out mainly to Nigeria, but also to Niger, Northern Cameroon, <coughs> Ghana, and other parts of Africa um, where you have Hausa speaking people. Um, in Nigeria alone, we have um, a weekly audience of uh, more than 21 million. And uh, that's who are mainly based in northern Nigeria. But of course, you do have people across uh, you know, Nigeria that understand and, and speak Hausa and who obviously um, uh, you know, listen to, to, to our output. Um, Nigeria, Lindsay said she wished that um, if we talk about Nigeria, you probably wouldn't make reference to violence, oil, and corruption. But unfortunately, that is the reality of, of uh, the Nigerian state um, as it is today. Um, Plateau. Now, what happens in Plateau, um, I wouldn't want to go into history, but it does have a lot of um, history behind it. The crisis in Plateau in just has a lot of history behind it. 
um, people who are of uh, you know House of Fulani Muslim, modern Nigeria came to reside in just more than almost a hundred years ago, and um, since then, um, basically they have probably um, been going about doing their businesses. Today, um, you have um, other indigenous. Uh, peoples of the plateau who feel for one reason or the other that, you know, um, the Hausa people, the Hausa Muslim people, Hausa Fulani, because you see, that's the thing, you see, you can't talk about Hausa Fulani without bringing Muslim, although when you speak to the politicians, particularly uh, the, the indigenous plateau people, they say, no, 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 it's not about religion, it's about uh, the politics of of House of Fulani and, and, and the non houses So it's a very, very complex, complex issue. Uh, but um, the way I understand it uh, as an editor, as a journalist, is um, one factor tends to um, affect the other. Um, but in my opinion, um, it's mainly to do with the resource control. Um, you know, um, you have politicians who are the indigenous plateau people, the the Biron people, and and, and perhaps um, uh, other other um, uh, ethnic groups of plateau um, who would like to have absolute control of their resources in plateau state. But on the other hand, you have the Hausa, Fulani, Muslim. A minority who feel well we have been here we've lived here for more than 100 years and as a result of that we have to have some kind of representation politically speaking we have to we have to hold political offices we are entitled to to certain um, 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 privileges just like um, everyone else in, in you know the indigenous of plateau state um, that is the main argument, but other people will say, do you know there are some elements, religious elements in, in the crisis? Uh, now, last month I was in Plateau State and I was actually investigating the crisis. And um, I, I spoke to a cross-section of the people, both the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And one of the, um, one of the, the, the um, a very interesting quotation came out of my conversation with one of the um, the Christian leaders who said to me, Jamila, I'll tell you what this crisis is all about. And I'm going to read you a quotation which I had never heard in my life until then. He said, the new nation called Nigeria should be an estate from our great grandfather, Othman and Fodio. We must ruthlessly prevent a change of power. We must use the minorities in the north as willing tools and the south as conquered territories and never allow them to have control of the future. Now what this, past, this um, gentleman said to me um, was that this was a quotation that was um, made by the late um, Sadana Sokoto on the 12th of October 1960 in a newspaper called The Parrot. I've done all sorts of research as a journalist. I have not come across this um, parrot, uh, parrot newspaper. I don't know, maybe some of you might, and I'd, I'd be very happy if you point me in the direction. I haven't been to the British Library yet, uh, the Archives of Museum. But what they are saying is this is a quotation that is now sort of been duplicated and sent via mobile phone text messages. And um, this, this, this is the reason, apparently, why some people are doing what they are doing, because there is fear that uh, the, 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 the house of Fulani of Plateau State uh, actually on a mission to, um, to, to turn Plateau State, to turn just into an Islamist society. So basically that's what it is. From my understanding, there is a deeply rooted, deeply rooted hatred and mistrust between the House of Fulani Muslim on the one hand and the Christian and indigenous uh, people of Plateau State how the government of Nigeria, the federal government of Nigeria, is going to deal with this major issue is something that, as I am talking to you now, nobody knows. Last week, I was in the United States of America. Acting President um, Goodluck Jonathan was there. And in my um, interview with him for the BBC um, television and, and radio, I asked him how he, um, he 
he, he intends to sort out plateau. And he went on and on and on and on and said, look, we understand what the problem is. It's to do with uh, 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 poverty, with politics, with resource control. But we are talking to the people. So you really don't have any concrete ideas as to how the politicians, because it is indeed a political problem. And you need to have the political will. You need to have the political mechanism you know, to ensure that um, this, this, this um, crisis comes to an end. But nobody is actually prepared to do it because, as I was um, saying to Lindsay earlier, there, it's, it's so, you can, there, there is some kind of analogy. I mean, if, if you want to, as an outsider, I mean, not me, perhaps some of you as outsiders, if you'd like to understand more the just crisis, it's, it's, it, I would say it's something similar to the white farmers issue in Zimbabwe and South Africa. So if you were to say, OK, let's just go for it, sort out plateau, sort out just, you may probably be opening a can of worms across some states in northern Nigeria, and perhaps by extension even uh, in, in parts of southern Nigeria. So it's a very complex uh, uh, um, situation. It's a very complex crisis, which I, I can't possibly sit in front of you and say, this is the way forward. But I, I have listened to all the different um, stakeholders, and I understand and I see um, the views they present. But up to now, like I said, no tangible, tangible measures of moving forward. OK, thank you very much um, for that, which I'm afraid was wasn't a very optimistic prognosis at the end, but realistic again. So now I'm going to turn to um, Dr. Kataza Gondwe from Christian Solidarity Worldwide, who will give us something of a message from the Archbishop, but also, I hope, talk a little bit in her own right mm. about um, Joss. I was going to comment mainly on what you had said, yes, and also what please. Jamila just said. Um, you start off by saying there have been killings twice this year. <laughs> these killings have continued since yes. January. Yep. Yep. And in Fair fact, enough. they preceded what January. From, yep. from December onwards, there had been uh, attacks and attacks and attacks on Christians in the Joss North area. And then you had the huge attack in January, another huge attack, and on it goes. But at the, as of yesterday and today, I've heard of attacks in the area of Rion, where people have been killed. So it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. I think the problem with the press is that they like to put things into neat little boxes. And they like to say it started here and it ended there. But it is much bigger than that. And uh, unless you see the whole picture and deal with it its entirety, you'll never get to the root of what is happening in Plateau State, and you'll never resolve the situation that is ongoing there. I also wanted to say um, it's interesting that in Plateau State, there are many indig non-indigenous tribes, many settler tribes, yet only one tribe is the one that feels, um, shall I say, um, unhappy and is involved in the violence. The others are not so bothered about not being indigenous tribes. In, in this indigenous issue is a national issue. It isn't confined to Plateau State. It is the requirement of the Nigerian constitution. So if it has to be changed, it has to be changed at a constitutional level. And one state cannot be singled out for the purposes of change just because people feel that this will somehow placate a group of, 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 of people who are upset and therefore resorting to violence, whatever um, the justifications for this. I also wanted to note that in states where the House of Fulani themselves are the largest indigenous um, tribe, that non-indigenous, <coughs> well, no, indigenous non-Muslims do not actually have a say. I have been to areas where there are no schools, there are no, um, there are no wealth. Basic social amenities that are provided to Muslim villages are deprived to these people. I'll mention one area in Rogo. So this isn't just about Plateau State. This is about a bigger issue. It's about justice across the north and center of Nigeria. And if you isolate Plateau State and see it in isolation, you'll miss the bigger picture. So in terms of um, the quote from the Sultan, I'll happily help you search for that, because I've heard it. And I also want to source it before I you know, anything. But that is a very recent thing. It doesn't um, explain the violence that has happened recently. This quote has just come out during the recent violence, but it, didn't, it wasn't there or it wasn't being circulated in 2001 when the largest outbreak of violence began and then continued to date. Um, in terms of uh, 
what you said about deep mistrust. There is deep mistrust on both sides. But as you understand from the um, comment that I'm about to rapidly cut into little pits for you from the Archbishop, he feels that the press is highly, highly culpable in this as well. So this is, uh, the, these are the words of the Archbishop of Jos, who couldn't make it. He apologized for not being here. And we tried everything, but the ash defeated us. <laughs> so um, up till this morning. So uh, he says, the international media reports affecting Jos have largely not been done with care and with the interest of community building at heart. There is often little regard for the repercussions of showing dead bodies in a mosque, for example. And there is a lack of understanding of the root causes of the misunderstanding between communities, which cut through economic, economy, politics, ethnicity, social and educational divides, as well as religion. And it should be noted that the problems do not necessarily begin with religion. The international media have portrayed Jos and Plateau State as a place not hospitable to, to Muslims. This is unfair and is contributing heavily to the present crisis in Plateau State. Um, unfortunately, the type of international coverage given has not helped in community building. I wish the international media would learn from the Nigerian media, which reports not only the effect of the crisis, but also on the causes of the crisis, and then challenges government to find a solution for harmonious living and nation building. The international media has portrayed Christians in a very bad light, without taking any cognizance of the fact that there are here pagans or animists, or people who simply do not care about any religion, but they are all non-Muslim. However, in the case of a, a misunderstanding or crisis between such people and some of the Muslim community, the international media reports such incidences as being Christian-Muslim conflicts. Barbaric acts and ungodly behavior, including wanton destruction of lives and property, carried out by such persons are simply attributed to Christian-Muslim conflicts. This has heightened tension, and as if that were not bad enough, reporting such in the international media has marred the image of Christians on the plateau. With this kind of bad reporting, reprisal attacks and counter-reprisal attacks have taken place, much to our collective shame. The international media has made itself the prosecutor, the jury, and the judge, and has sentenced whomsoever they choose to sentence. And sadly, we are paying the price with much blood. A careful, sensitive, and sensible reporting for the building of communities around the world remains the best offering any media can make in the service of humanity. I'll stop Thank there. you. I wonder if, before we go on, somebody um, should maybe one of you two could explain this thing about antigenes and settlers, because not everybody in the audience may be familiar um, with what, as you explain, is part of the, the Nigerian constitution. Could you do that for us, Jamila, just to make sure everybody is across this? Well, in a nutshell, um, I have probably explained it um, earlier. The indigents are the people who are the in quotes, the true citizens, sons of Plateau State. And um, they could be um, the Birombs. I mean, there are several ethnic groups in, in Plateau State. Whereas the non-indigenous uh, people, mainly the largest groups, uh, tend to be the Hausa Fulani Muslim. But of course, over the years, people from southern Nigeria have come to live in Plateau. And these include um, the Igbo ethnic groups, right? The, the, the Yorubas and, and people from central Nigeria. But they have different rights. <sighs> yes. Like she said, like she said, even the, Ni the Nigerian constitution actually does encourage the culture of indigen and non-indigen. Yes. So what that means is there are certain privileges that I can get as a plateau indigen mm. and which you as a Kano indigen, originally Kano indigen mm. wouldn't get. Even if your grand, even, if, even though you were, you were born in plateau or your, your father was born in plateau, the fact that your great grandfather came 90 years ago 
in spite of that, fact, the fact that your father was born there, your mother was born there, you were born there, there are certain privileges that you wouldn't get because originally you came from Kano, right? So that's mm. unfortunately it's basically what privileges it means. or advantages given to the indigenous tribes of right. a certain area. Okay, I and think again, that it's that, not yeah. limited to plateau. Yes. It, I it's not, because yeah, I think that helps clear. us give a context when we're saying yeah. that it's not Indigen simply Muslim non, Christian. Yeah. Complex. That's uh, that's, that's, that's true. Lines, that's true. But problem. if we are going to be a bit more objective, you can argue that in certain places, although in spite of the fact that the constitution does not allow um, for for non-indigenous to have certain privileges, some states are quite relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you can actually strive to hold certain political offices. I'd say that in plat in the north. Plateau was probably one of the more relaxed ones, from okay. what I have investigated. Okay, so we, I think I was trying to clarify something, and yeah. now I think we've learned how complicated that issue is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, um, let's go on with uh, Michael, Michael Peel. Can you give us some of this in the, in the broader context, because we're also talking about instability in government in Nigeria and the, the Delta, all at the same time. Thank you, Lindsay. A small order then. Good evening, everybody. Um, now, at the risk of uh, bringing down the wrath of the Archbishop on my head, like a ton of volcanic, <laughs> like a ton of volcanic ash, I, I just want to refer back to um, an international media report um, uh, on on violence in Plateau, which uh, comes from the the AFT, and it talks about the Nigerian government intensifying efforts to contain fighting in uh, in the northern city of Jos amid concerns that as many as 500 people have been killed. Um, that comes from 14th of September 2001. Um, when, of course, there was another event in the world news that was dominating um, the, the, the headlines. Um, and I think that that is significant for two reasons. We, um, one is that it shows that what's been going on in Joss and wider plateau has been going on for a very long time. Um, and secondly, it shows how it has this tendency to um, really be obscured in the world's eye. And, um, you know, people either, I think, in Nigeria and outside haven't really Got, got to grips with it um, in the way that they should have done. Because not only is it a, a humanitarian crisis mm. of um, large proportions in its own right, mm. it is also a microcosm, as um, Lindsay referred to and as the other speakers have also suggested, um, of a bigger crisis of, of stability in Nigeria that I think um, you know, the world needs to pay a, a lot more attention to. Um, for, for reasons that, that I'll explain. Um, just to introduce myself very, very briefly, I, I'm the, as Lindsay said, the former uh, West Africa correspondent of the Financial Times. Um, I first visited um, uh, Nigeria in uh, 2001 and uh, um, have uh, ne never quite uh, uh, left it behind in, uh, over the years. And I had the three years living there as the correspondent between 2002 and 2005. After that, I worked on a, uh, a book, uh, which uh, Lindsay kindly mentioned. And indeed, some kind person has uh, <laughs> laid out in uh, large numbers beside me. It's called A Swamp Full of Dollars. And it, uh, um, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a brisk um, uh, romp through the murky world of oil in Nigeria and um, everything that goes on around that, both in Nigeria and its implications for the, the wider world. And uh, I, I believe it's here available at a not to be repeated discount of uh, about 40% from the published price. So what, for 11 pounds? It's 10 pounds. It, could, it, 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 can, it can be yours. I'm going to give it a chance. So it's... Um, so that what is happening in Plateau is, is a microcosm, as I say, I think, of a, of a greater um, crisis of, of, of stability in, in Nigeria. And it's a failure of, 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 of leadership to a large extent in, in Nigeria and also in, in the international community, um, I think. Um, I'm not an expert on the crisis in Jos. Um, I did report on um, the, the, the violence in Plateau in 2004 um, when, when I was the correspondent based there. And um, again, as the other speakers suggested, um, uh, while clearly it would be absurd to ignore um, the, uh, the role of, of religious differences in the crisis, I did come increasingly to view it really as one of many outlets for a kind of sense of otherness um, which cuts across many different facets of, of life. And, and obviously the settler indigen issue, which, which we've discussed, is one of them. Um, you know, um, some. Uh, 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 tensions over who dominates commerce in particular places, over grazing rights, and perhaps most notably of all, at least when I was there, over political power 
um, and the fact that um, you know it's perceived as being held um, by certain groups who uh, are very uh, unwilling to let go of it, even though um, nominally Nigeria has been a democracy since 1999. And that really does play into the bigger picture because um, uh, Nigeria has been under civilian rule now for the longest period since, it's, um, uh, since it became independent in, in 1960. And um, you have a situation um, yet where we've, we've had three elections um, which um, have all been um, had large uh, and, uh, fraud and um, intimidation in various places uh, taking place. I've reported on two of them from the Niger Delta. And this is a big problem for Nigeria. It's one of the world's 10 most populous nations. Let's not forget that. It's a, a, a fact that a lot of people are, are still surprised by. I talked to the most populous nation in Africa by far. Um, you know, there's clearly a large humanitarian aspect to this. There's also a large geopolitical aspect to this. So even if you're a cynical pragmatist, you'll care about the oil and the fact that um, you know, Nigeria is a, is a um, uh, when it's at full production anyway, is a world top 10 oil exporter, a very significant source of oil imports to, to the United States. Um, so this is why people outside of Nigeria should care. And the failure of um, politics under civilian rule um, it works on a number of levels, um, I think. But um, one sees it in the Niger Delta, which I'm most familiar with, because that, that's the subject that um, um, my, my book is about, um, and in the, the corruption that's taken place there. And, and basically, a huge theft of resources and a mismanagement of resources, um, which has yielded very large profits for oil companies, has enriched certain government officials and, and expatriate interests. Um, but really hasn't filtered through to the, the, the population of this, this vast country at all. And um, we see glimpses of this in um, cases that have started to come up actually in the UK um, w um, involving corruption, um, one of which, uh, funnily enough, involves a former governor of Plateau State um, yeah. called Joshua Darier, who was uh, the governor when I um, used to live uh, in, in Nigeria. Um, he was um, police here, as, as I understand it, were in investigating a fairly sort of commonplace um, alleged fraud. And then they, um, they came across uh, somebody who they suspected of being involved, uh, wound the thread back, and found he was actually a governor of a state in Nigeria. He was duly arrested here, um, but then skipped bail and went back to Nigeria. And that was the last that was heard of that case. And since then, there's been another governor uh, arrested um, um, uh, in, in similar circumstances here who um, was charged with money laundering, and yet you guessed it, he too skipped bail. Um, and um, uh, and, and uh, according to the news reports, dressed as a woman, um, oh. he, he made his way across borders back to Nigeria, which uh, he said was a, a grave insult to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, 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 to his pride. Um, but I mean, the, the serious point of this, of course, is that this, this corruption is not a Nigerian problem, because, um, and of course, in the case of Mr. Daria, that case has never been tried, so these remain allega only allegations. Um, but we see involvement of all sorts of financial institutions <coughs> in these cases mm -hmm. and others, high street banks, estate agents who sell properties through which um, money is laundered by Nigerian officials, oil money, basically, um, either from the source of from the, the, the officials who are in the Niger Delta or where there are other governors involved is the oil money that filters down into their states and forms mostly the, the bulk of, of, of state income. Now, I don't want to talk too long because there's a lot to get through, but um, that's the kind of um, diagnosis, um, I guess, which, which is, a, um, it, it is a, a depressing one, but um, maybe I could just spend one minute just talking about um, the prognosis and how I think that, um, you know, um, people outside of Nigeria can, um, can help um, the progressive forces in Nigeria, which are there, um, um, absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that, and as Lindsay said, you know, the, the big picture in Nigeria does look very alarming. But of course, anyone who spends any time there, um, I, I think, um, can't help but be, be, be sort of amazed and, and, um, and, and, and fascinated by the intensity of the place. There's a lot of energy there to, to be released. And a lot of it's dissipated at the moment in, in frustration and you know, the, the people were fighting against a, you know, a huge sort of beer moth uh, system. 
Um, but um, I mean, I, I haven't actually seen it, but um, there is a documentary about Lagos on at the moment, which has had really, really good reviews, which um, um, sort of brings out that kind of entrepreneurial zest that you, you see across the country. So that, that could be worth a look. Um, very quickly, I think there are three things that um, internationally um, uh, the, the, the world needs to do to engage with Nigeria a bit more. Um, one is on elections. There are elections due next year. Um, every election is critical, please, um, <coughs> more so than most, because the situation is so fluid at the moment with, as, as has been alluded to earlier, a, a president who um, you know, is, is obviously very ill um, and, and Vice President Goodluck Jonathan um, assuming more, more and more powers. Um, Nigerian observers, international observers, have a crucial role, I think, in helping to ensure that this election is, if not perfect, then at least a lot better than the ones that have gone previously. And uh, um, uh, until the last election in 2007, there was a marked reluctance of um, um, outside countries to um, make a fuss and take up the very credible reports that were coming, not just from Western journalists like me, but from Nigerian observer groups and from Nigerians themselves on the ground about how fraudulent the election was in a lot of places. And so that is one place where the world can really um, help Nigeria work with Nigerians um, and, and engage on that. Um, second area is in tackling corruption. Um, money laundering rules have tightened. Um, the Sania, but the Sania Batcha case, which, um, for, as you probably don't need reminding, involved, according to British official estimates, $1.3 billion of looted money being processed through the United Kingdom. Um, that was supposed to be the watershed, the never again moment. Um, but it still happened. Maybe not quite on that scale, but there's still a lot of corruption out there. The cases that I've cited and seen, um, you, you see many um, British uh, high street uh, institutions turning up as conduits for dirty money. So I don't think we should be under any illusions that that's a problem um, that, that has been solved. Um, there's been some effort um, here to set up new police units. Um, um, to which uh, have taken on um, quite a bit of work from, from Nigeria, almost, almost by default. Um, but uh, more still needs to be, be done on that, and more needs to be done not only on the, 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 the hard stuff, the gritty stuff of prosecutions, but on embarrassing the financial institutions as well, to saying that this is something that's not acceptable. And obviously, with the post-credit crunch mood, um, that, I think, is a message that you know, has, a, has a wide attraction, because you know, in some sense, a lot of people feel cheated by, by what has happened. Um, and then the final thing is um, in the area of, of responsible business. And um, it's a talk in itself to, 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 to tell you what's happening in the Niger Delta. Um, and um, this is something my, my book goes into in, um, in, in quite a lot of, of detail. But um, the, uh, many of you will be aware of the big picture story that over um, 52 years of, of oil production, hundreds of billions of dollars have made their way out of the, the Niger Delta, but there's um, very little to show for it on the ground other than the negative side of oil pollution. Um, and um, um, not just those sort of obvious oil slicks, although they're bad, but light pollution, these enormous gas flares which still illuminate the horizon like a ghostly yellow glow, which like some tyrannical sun which stops people sleeping. They cause acid rain as well, which eats into people's houses. Um, the story of oil in Nigeria has been told, um, but not enough. And there needs to be much more pressure um, exerted on the various actors, Nigerian and non-Nigerian, who are involved in that. Um, one big picture example to conclude on is the smuggling of oil, which is an enormous problem still in Nigeria. Um, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars a year of oil uh, smuggled from the delta, um, sold illicitly. Um, they generate profits, which I think is widely accepted, and then cycled back into um, the purchase of arms in Nigeria, fueling the kind of violence um, that we've seen in, in militant groups and, and so forth and so forth. Um, that um, is something that um, could be tackled to a degree by, I think, by some um, promising research which has gone on on labeling oil. So. In other words, it's like the idea of conflict diamonds. You know, we're, we're aware of the story of that. Um, you have a certification um, 
system for diamonds. Um, so if they come from war zones, it ought to be obvious to potential buyers that they are, and um, it ought to be um, uh, not allowed for them to then buy those diamonds. That seems to have been a pretty successful campaign. Oil's tougher, obviously it's not solid, it's, um, it's more difficult to mark chemically, but there is research going on, and as I understand it, there have been some, some promising results, including at a, a university here, at the University of Plymouth. Um, that's something that could be taken forward. That's something in which um, progressive forces in Nigeria and outsiders could both play a role in taking forward. And I think, um, so to try and you know, finish on an optimistic note, and you know, as someone who's lived in Nigeria um, and um, you know, had a, 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 an involvement with it for, for, I guess, almost 10 years now, um, although in the short term it, it is often very difficult, I find, to, to feel optimistic because of everything that's going on, things like we see in Plateau and elsewhere. The longer term, I feel that you know this is a country which um, you know can and will go places. But um, there are a lot of things that need to be done um, between now and then, and um, um, I hope we can talk about some of them afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you probably saw we did a little fancy footwork. There was a substitute who retreated to the bench, <laughs> and um, then we got the real Abdul <laughs> Ralph <Rafael> Mustafa, <laughs> and um, here he is, all the way from St Anthony's College, Oxford, who is now going to give us his version of events in Nigeria and uh, make us feel very optimistic before we, uh, before we go to the Q&A. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. I'm sorry to be late. I don't have the excuse of the volcanic ash. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, British Rail hasn't made my case any easier either. Um, and thank you, Deepa, for saving my bacon as it were. Deepa is my junior brother. So. Well, that's what we thought, you see. That's why, you, that's yeah. why we, we press gangs in. Um, listening to my two contemporaries uh, or, or, uh, here, I'm tempted to actually devote myself to addressing the issues both of you have raised. But maybe that's not the best way to go. Uh, I better put my own stall on the table as well as it were. I think to the extent that Christian youth and Muslim youth are killing each other and other people in just, there is a religious problem. And every study has shown that Nigeria is one of the most divided societies when it comes to the issue of Christian uh, Muslim pro, uh, issue. It's also the case that Muslims are very internally divided as well and actually do fight and kill each other often, though this is not uh, reflected. In a sense, the point is that religion is a problem in that country. Everybody claims to believe in God and whatever, and you don't see much of it in their behavior, either to other people or to the wider society in general. So I think the first thing is the whole question of religion in that society. Um, in many ways, it's also a force for good, the role of the churches in combating HIV and all of that. But once you come to the politicization of religion, it's a big problem. But the problem in Joss, I think, religion is the symptom rather than the real substance of the issue. Uh, the first time that uh, the communities in Joss fought each other, it was over property. So we're talking of uh, a problem that has very deep historical roots, even <coughs> going to the period before the, the colonial state was put in place. Uh, a problem that has to do with issues of culture, of respect, issues of property and rights, of citizenship, of political power, of political ambitions. So it's this cluster that have all come together and take the religious form that they do. Now, the unfortunate thing is that ideally you'll imagine that in a democratic society, you should have the process and the institution to address this the institutions and the leadership, as Michael said, have become part of the problem, particularly since 2001. So it's a failure of institutions, it's a failure of leadership, it's a historically embedded struggle over belonging, over power, over individual ambitions, and over citizenship as well. Right, okay, very good. What I think we'll do now is open up for questions. Now, I would say on questions, we've, have you got a microphone? Melissa will bring the uh, microphone around. Please say your name, and if you have a, 
an affiliation, you know, organization um, that is relevant, please tell it so. But um, can I say, we should keep comments and questions short to a couple of, of minutes. Um, we don't want, uh, there is one gentleman in Dolkol, but we don't want sermons. <laughs> so you can, you can give a sermon, unless you are authorized. One of these is authorized. Okay, any, uh, any questions and comments? Gentleman there on the there. Thank you. Um, my name's Alan Barty. Uh, I'm still a little bit uncertain about what are the restrictions on the settlers. We, we read a lot about the religious differences. We read about the cattle, cattle herders against the, uh, the farmers. But these restrictions on the settlers is something that we don't actually read very much about. I'd like to hear something more about what they actually are. And the second question is, we haven't really mentioned how the, uh, the the new president is affecting the situation. Yeah. Uh, does it have an impact on it, he, he, mm -hmm. being a Christian, the former one, being a Muslim? Yeah. Does that actually impact on it? Very good. Um, restrictions on the settlers. Who wants to take that one? I don't mind a little bit on it. Can you talk about yeah, that one? Yeah. Um, most of them really are restrictions in terms of certain political positions that they cannot hold. So certain high offices are reserved for indigenous tribes of any given state. So that's, that's throughout the whole um, of Nigeria. But as she said, some are more relaxed about it than others, and some are stricter than Plata State. And uh, basically, there are representatives, Muslim, Hasaflani representatives of Plata State in, for example, the Federal House of Assembly, and also in the State House of Assembly. So there are not that many positions possibly apart from governor, if that's what you really want to contest for, that would uh, necessitate <coughs> the kind of violence we're seeing. What about judicial positions? Judicial, oh, those, those are mostly um, federal appointments anyway. Oh. So that's, yeah. that, you know, that's sort of like broadly yeah. a, a federal thing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not. So you have a different structure um, going on there. <sighs> Plato, very delicate, right? The truth is, um, even as it is today, right? Mm -hmm. When you talk about federal representation, right? At the National Assembly, you only have one person, mm -hmm. right? From Joss North, who is a member of the House of, of Representatives. House. Mm -hmm. One. Right? And. Uh, uh, at the upper house, the Senate, mm -hmm. we've got one as well. And that is exactly what the problem is. They are saying, look, this is not enough. And let me be very honest with you. Some of the Christian community leaders I have spoken with have said to me, look, we allowed the, 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 the House and Muslim politicians to go to Abuja. By the way, Abuja is the capital of Nigeria, and that is where you have the um, federal legislators, right? But they go and they ask the president of Nigeria to impose a state of emergency on Plateau State. Well, they are ingrates. I'm quoting him now, and I've, I've got all my... And they are months, ingrates. I can believe it. And what we have now resolved to do is we will never allow them to seek any political office other than the local councillor. They won't even, we won't even allow them to become local mm. government chairman. Mm. That is what they have resolved to do. Yes, and, I, and I probably, I'm not taking sides no, here. No, no, I'm but what I'm saying is this, yeah. right? They are very sort of, the, the, the issue is, is, is quite emotive. Mm -hmm. They are not happy. And they have said, if the fact that we are allowing them to go to Abuja, to, they are playing politics with our lives, then we won't, henceforth, we won't allow them to hold any political office other than the local councillor. Now, if we keep them here, and what it means is they won't go and ask the president to impose a state of em emergency. And that will now bring me to the second question. W whether and why pres the acting president 
Jonathan Goodluck has not been able to do anything. Well, he can't do anything for now because he's a politician. And he's trying to survive. And, and, and there are indications that he may possibly be seeking political office in December or January 2011, 20, right? And as a result of that, he wouldn't want to do anything that would offend the Christian constituency, the Christian voters, and he's Christian himself. And on the other hand, he also would not like to do anything that would offend the Muslim voters. Mm -hmm. So he's sitting on the fence. And he's saying, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to the traditional rulers who have great influence across northern Nigeria, right? To go and talk to the people, to the Muslims and the Christians, right? And the cartel hearted, the Fulanis, right? So that we find a solution. Mm -hmm. I've heard the same quote that you mentioned there, but slightly differently. Okay. People saying that we voted yeah, them and to, this is what has happened. To, to, you see what I mean? To um, Ralph mm. here. Can you? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I disagree with my compatriots all over Please. again. Please. <laughs> That's why we're here. Yes. That's why we're here to disagree. I think there are, there are substantial restrictions on settlers yes. across the country. Your child has uh, a second chance, second class access to educational institutions. True. When they get there, they pay higher fees than the indigenous. Uh, and people have reciprocated with this sense of alienation by going off to their home areas to register during uh, elections and censuses so that the resources tied to their personhood goes to their natal homes not where they actually live. is the collapse of the citizenship system in the country. So settlers across the board suffer this restriction mm. all over, mm. except in places like Lagos. Not without a tussle, but Lagos is relatively quite open. They recognize most of the communities that are there. There's an, an Igbo person from the southeast who holds one of the most important portfolios in the Lagos State Cabinet as we speak. And many other non Lagosians who are Yoruba constantly serve in the Lagos cabinet and then go to their home states. But across the country, uh, so called settlers have that stigma attached to their uh, position. It's not necessarily legal, but it's certainly social. The people in Jos, however, the house are full and in Jos, I find it difficult to see them as settlers in the classical Nigerian sense. These are people who have been there since 1904, possibly earlier in some instances. How long are you going to live in a place before you become re your rights become recognized? Many of us Nigerians here, we go to Russia. There's nowhere you go in the world you don't find Nigerians. And they carry passports for all these countries. But you can't go from your local government to the next in Nigeria and be recognized. Mm. There's something wrong with that. Can, can I ask you, I'm going to abuse my position as the chair and ask a stupid <laughs> question. Mm -hmm. Why has Nigeria persisted with this system of defining people as antigenes and settlers in this way when from what I'm gathering, it's a rather it's a disruptive and divisive system? I think they thought that it would help. They thought but it would obviously help. Obviously, it's not. And it's yeah. under review right now because it's seen as A, unfair, and B, unhelpful. Yes. So it's actually, at the moment, the whole system is under review. It's and it's hopefully, yeah. it's the it same will reason be, yeah. why you brought the federal character. Yeah. Isn't it? The federal character is a, a mechanism, a, a kind of a concept, which, um, because the, at the moment, there are 36 states that form. Mm -hmm. The, you know, the Federation of Nigeria. So basically the principle is because we do not want, when I say we collectively as Nigerians, right, we do not want one ethnic group to dominate the United. other. So we, the concept of federal character was introduced. So it's basically the same reason why yeah. you have such principle enshrined in Nigeria's constitution. But the same reason why you have introduced it is the same reason why that it's causing the problem. Because like uh, mm. Dr. here rightly said, how long are you going to stay in, say, mm. uh, you know, Nasarawa local government before you are actually allowed to become 
citizen. Mm. But an okay. indigent. I think we should move on to another issue because I see we've got lots of hands going up now. So let me go to um, let me go to the back. There's a gentleman there waving a. Well, then, then we'll move around because I know there's lots of questions. Um, I just wanted to ask if the meeting has already discussed the Indigenes Bill, which the MP Samaila Mohammed has tabled in the Parliament. Um, I'm sorry, I got here after the meeting yeah. started. Yeah, we haven't discussed the Indigenes um, Bill. Bill. I, and if not, is it <coughs> is it um, relevant? Is it something where where they're likely to have a useful discussion in the Parliament or or not? Hopefully. Do you want to talk yeah. about it? Well, why don't we? You, you, you know, Ismail. Ismail. Yeah, I think this is the second attempt to. Uh, uh, modify the indigenous um, the bill, uh, the indigenous uh, clause in the Nigerian constitution. Mm. I doubt that it will get anywhere, uh, just as the first one didn't get, get far. And it has to do with the question you asked mm. earlier. Why do people institute such obviously destructive? The reason is that different parts of the country, their education, social, in the, every social indicator, they are so unequal. Mm, right. If you allow an open competition, one side will dominate one thing or the other. Mm. And there's so much mistrust that people do not feel they can entrust their interests to be served by the qualified people from other places. Right. So they want their own people to be there. That's the basis of the federal character, which means all Nigerian institutions should reflect the composition of the country. Fair enough. But where the problem comes is that it then goes hand in hand with the second thing, which is the indigenous uh, settler. Mm -hmm. And that one is completely contrary to our history, our culture, and everything. If you allow people to belong based on whatever criteria, hopefully they can still represent different parts of the country. That shouldn't be a problem. But now you have the, co the overlapping of two very uh, divisive, if you like, rules. And all the attempts to change them haven't been, they, they don't have any uh, purchase in society as a whole. Uh, I don't know if you check today's newspapers. Uh, in Next, there's the headline that the police have decided to do away with federal character. Mm -hmm. I know that's not possible. So there are many people who are pushing mm. against this thing, but it's not getting far. Mm. Okay, mm. let's move on. Any more questions? <coughs> oh, let's just go to the back. Um, yeah, let's go to this lady there, and then we'll sort of come forward a bit. Hello, my name's Elizabeth Blunt. Oh, I started sorry. my career as a reporter in Nigeria and ended it in Ethiopia. Uh, and when I started, post-independence leaders in Nigeria were saying, we are all Nigerians. And in the, over in Ethiopia, the imperial regime was saying, we are all Ethiopians. But since then, and it's a long while, we're talking about 30, 40 years, um, politicians have discovered that it's extremely popular to say to people, you can have, in Nigeria, your own state, <coughs> your own local <coughs> government area. In Ethiopia, your own region, your own special warrior. Uh, and the moment people get their own special area, they can turn around and say to somebody else, okay, this is our area, it's not your area. Mm -hmm. um, which seems to me extremely pernicious, even though it's been popular in both places. And also in Yugoslavia, thinking of the Frontline mm -hmm. Club. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that in Ethiopia, the opposition has made this a political issue and an election issue. Um, they're opposing this endless <coughs> devoluting into areas. Now, it's not entirely disinterested because most of them are Amhara, who were the top people when it was uh, all one country. So while since I've been in Nigeria, I would like to know whether the Nigerian opposition is beginning to identify this as a problem and is beginning to make it a political and an election issue. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a few more questions and we'll hold that one <coughs> there, whether it's becoming a political issue. Um, lady here in the white, and then we'll go to gentlemen. I just wondered if we could hear your thoughts on the amnesty in the Delta. Is this real change? Is it sustainable? Or is this, this just a temporary, a temporary thing? Okay, and then gentlemen there, in, that's right. 
Uh, we've heard a lot tonight about um, about the deep mistrust between the two different tribes and also how the constitution has been written and rigged in a certain way to essentially manufacture the outcome that we're having now, one of uh, mistrust and violence. Isn't a big elephant in the room that everybody's ignoring the fact that a lot of these tribes, a lot of these people don't belong together and maybe a solution could be one of division? Oh, that elephant. That elephant on the continent. Right. I'm going to take those three and then I'm going to come to some others. Um, Michael, let me, um, let me ask you about amnesty in the, in the Delta. Uh, yeah, um, I think that I, I have a, um, a bit of a sense of deja vu with, it, with this amnesty because um, when, when I was the correspondent in 2004 or five, there was uh, also an amnesty where um, uh, the, 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 the main warlords then, a guy called Dokoboa, sorry, and um, Ateke Tom, um, came out of the bush. Um, they were given um, money, um, dished it out to their lads. They got contracts, um, security contracts, some of them with the, were defending the very oil companies they were <laughs> campaigning against. Um, and there was a sort of peace for a while. Um, but um, uh, gradually things slipped back again because there was, while there was a bit of money sloshing around for a kind of immediate demobilization, there were none of the um, things in place that are needed to, you know, stop this this con these kind of conflicts actually happening. Um, education, jobs, p things for people who are fighting to to to, to do otherwise, and. Uh, um, a, a friend of mine, or a Nigerian friend of mine, who I was asking about this um, um, uh, latest amnesty, said said to me rather cynically, "Well, I, I think the peace will last as long as the money does." Um, <laughs> and um, you know, that's that's a, a fairly sort of dark view of things. But um, I think that I haven't heard any or seen any evidence so far that the sort of longer term things that um, will help to stop this conflict have been put in place any more than they have last time. And so I, I think one should look at it with, with a deal of skepticism. OK, let's put the other two together. Liz Blunt's asking whether anybody in the opposition is really um, turning against this kind of divisionism and, uh, and so on. And then the gentleman asking about the federalism. Federalism, yes. But we're, yes, all, oh. we're sort of, but it's kind of ultra, ultra federalism we're talking about <laughs> now, aren't we, in, uh, in Nigeria. And, um, and the elephant in the room. Ah, <laughs> let's split the whole country up. Mm. Well, Liz, uh, my respects to you, Liz, my friend. Mm. Um, answer is no, it's not a political, I mean, no, no way. In fact, Nigeria, 36 states, right? More than 700 local governments. And as I am talking to you now, there is a great deal of campaigning going on amongst the politicians from the local council level to the, the federal level. And this campaign is about we, we want more states, we want more local governments. And the reason why they are kicking this first, why they are asking for the creation of more states, more local governments, is one reason, the issue of resource control, right? If there are 36 states, and you have got 500 local legislators. If we create more, there's a possibility that I may get in. And as a result of that, if, as a federal legislator, I get something in the region of 50 million naira per quarter, 50 million, you can divide that by probably 250. It's quite a lot of money, even by, um, by UK standards. Right, doctor? <laughs> <laughs> so, People would like that. So it's not about you know, development. It's not about infrastructure. It's not about making people's lives better. It's about my ability to get there so I can break my personal poverty chain, so that I can be ahead of my neighbor, ahead of the other people in my locality. So that is what it's all about. And again, it goes back to what was said earlier, the issue of corruption, the issue of amassing wealth at the total detriment 
right? Of you know, the, the, you know, millions of people. Now, according to the 2006 um, national census figures, there are more than uh, there are about 140 million uh, people in Nigeria. I believe there are more than that actually. And how much money does Nigeria earn from oil proceeds? Um, according to uh, Professor Sh Shamsuddin Usman, former finance minister and now uh, the, the planning minister. He says more than 80% of Nigeria's income is generated from oil wealth, right? Agriculture used to be the main thing long time ago before um, oil came. But everyone has, has left the farms. Many people have left the farms. People want to get rich fast. And that is what it's all about. Um, like you said earlier, like you, know, you, you suggested earlier, if at all, Nigeria can be fixed. Right? Don't get me wrong, Nigeria can be fixed. But this issue, I totally agree with you. We have to address certain issues. And the main ones are to do with free and fair elections, because it is only through the process of free and fair elections that elected representatives or politicians will be accountable to the people. And of course, as you know, if there is accountability, there is transparency, um, corruption, which is an issue that I, I, I suppose you find everywhere in the world can, to a large extent, be significantly reduced in Nigeria. The rule of law, politicians shall stop paying lip service to the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And really, these are the issues that we need to address. And the international community have indeed a role to play. Financial institutions shall stop being accomplices. So that when politicians steal the money from Nigeria, they should not be allowed to bring them into Switzerland, into United Kingdom, right. into America. Mm -hmm. And I think these are the issues we need to be talking about as well. Okay, let me give the elephant to these okay. two. <laughs> Who wants the elephant? I'll take the elephant. You have the elephant. <laughs> it's very easy to say, let's divide. It's a very easy thing to say, but if you remember, his, there's this saying that those who don't learn from their history are condemned to repeat it. Mm. Look what happened to India and Pakistan when they divided. You suddenly realize that it's not so straightforward as a straight line down the middle. In the north, you have significant, significant, I'm talking, non-Muslim minority tribes, indigenous to that area. Mm. Yeah? In the south, you have Muslims even in each family. I'm surprised you said that um, religion is a problem for Nigeria. I feel that the hope of Nigeria is looking at places like Lagos, etc., and the Yoruba tribe where you find that in one family mm. you can have Christians and Muslims, and they have lived happily in that way for a long time. Mm. Even in Plateau itself, in the Beron tribe that everyone has swept aside as a Christian tribe, there are Christians and Muslims found in that tribe. If that can be done, then this can be spread throughout the whole of Nigeria. I don't think it's going to be as easy as you think. If you split this place down the middle, you're isolating vulnerable um, communities in both areas. And uh, the consequence of this can be tragic. Yeah. Uh, even up till very recently, there was a, a not that recently, um, see how old I am, but there was a massacre of Muslims in India, even not so long, you know, in the recent past. That kind of thing will continue to happen. So there has to be a more creative way mm. of solving this problem. And I agree so much with, what you're, with your sum up, that there has to be, number one, rule of law enforced. Mm. I think once you have, we've had such a colossal failure of leadership, I think, throughout Africa. It's not that we're so useless that, and, and corrupt as it seems. We have creative people. We have uh, very, very intelligent uh, people. But the, the problem is we have allowed leaders to get into place who are not the people that should have been there. If you have the right leadership, not just in Nigeria, but in Ethiopia and elsewhere, most of these problems could be solved with the right leadership. Okay, if you look me, at Buhari, leave, leave. Buhari brought down corruption in his time, mm. and then he was kicked out. The lady who was the finance minister mm. before she was moved out brought down the national debt. It can be done, mm. but enforce the rule of law and take steps against corruption and you'll see that country transform completely.
Okay, let's take a couple more questions. Sorry, can I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, yeah pipe up, Dr. Go ahead. Uh, Liz, I think mm -hmm. we shouldn't compare Ethiopia and Nigeria too closely. In Nigeria, there was at least some negotiation in the 50s. And most Nigerians are agree that federalism is the way to, to mm -hmm. govern the country. What we haven't agreed on is the form and the units of that. In Ethiopia, I don't know that there was that kind of <laughs> negotiation. So that one was imposed. Uh, both the idea, the concept, and the form of it as ethnic federalism. Yes. Nigeria also doesn't admit to an ethnic federalist system. Ours is territorial rather than ethnic. Uh, so there are important uh, differences uh, here and there. Now that, as I, as I said earlier, we have no excuse for that. If you look at the way in which uh, cultural groups and individuals have moved historically. It doesn't work that way. In Kano City, for instance, there are parts of Kano whose origins can be traced. Totally nothing to do with the indigenous group there. Today, they are accepted as members of the community. One of them even became governor. Mm. And the current governor of Kano State is not indigenously from Kano either, yeah. but somehow, there's a, a, a point at which we click off from our own cultural history and adopt this legalistic attitude towards uh, where belonging, and that's really the problem. Okay, let's say... I'm sorry, the yeah, sorry. important issue of the elephant. The elephant. Be mm -hmm. careful what you pray for. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Because if it happens, I don't see, as she said, how you are going to sit down and divide that country. Mm -hmm. What's likely to happen is that there will be chaos all over. Mm -hmm. well, and that is to. not in anybody's well, interest. It has happened before. Yeah. Fred. I think I need to introduce myself. Um, I have been living in Jos since 1985. I am from the West, from Lagos. I'm also a British citizen. And so I think I, I think I have an experience of both worlds. I can only tell you my experience and my story. But very briefly. Briefly, yes. <laughs> you, have, you have two minutes maximum. Two minutes. Basically, I discovered, so let me just hit a bigger elephant here. Let me leave my story aside. The issue is radicalism. That's the issue in Plateau State. I didn't know this, but when I, I've been attacked twice, I also happen to be a Christian and a pastor in just north. And my church has been attacked twice. About five times, I almost lost my life. And the only reason we were attacked for was because we were a church close to the settlement. And what is happening, and my main concern now, is that um, you are having even people who were peaceful before arming themselves. Mm -hmm. This is the big elephant now that Plateau State can lead Nigeria into war. The only thing I don't agree with you, Doctor, sir, I agree with everything you've said, is that the House of Fulanis that have lived in Plateau State have lived there as long as the Yorubas, the Bumoshos, and the Urobus, and other people. The issue right now is, is a control for land and power, but some people are willing to pay any price. And that is the issue, radicalism. Innocent people are being killed. Let's not call it religious crisis. It's as if when terror gets on a plane and flies towards UK and US, we call it terror. But when it stays in central Nigeria, we call it ethnic, political. Mm. Let's stop that. Mm. It's mm. terror. Thank you. OK, let's, I'm going to take a few more. Let's take these two gentlemen. Um, yeah, if you could pass to this gentleman at the front and then the gentleman in red. We'll take both of you two and then we'll come back. Yes. Hello, my name is Kay Whiteman. I have been writing about West Africa for longer than I care to remember. And I was indeed working in Lagos when Michael Peel was there. I have two very targeted questions. One is for Jamila. Um, you gave us a very tantalizing trailer, Lindsay, about her interview with Babangida. Oh, I was hoping someone was going to ask this, because um, I was going to ask No mention was made. Having been myself yes. an IBB watcher for many years. <laughs> we'll get her. We'll get her to tell us. Okay. Well, the second one is directed at Michael Peel, who I happen to know, and this is also an issue with a lot of wide implications, has been very particularly interested in the whole question of the Halliburton affair, in which the American company Halliburton, former President Dick Cheney, 
um, was involved in a range of bribes offered to all sorts of Nigerian politicians. Now, recently, I don't know how much credence one gives to Sahara reporters, but they did publish a few days ago a list of a surprising number of people in the Nigerian political class yep. who are supposed to have received bribes from Halliburton. I wonder if you could bring us up to date in your researches on the Halliburton affair. Okay, that's fine. Then we can take the gentleman in the red here and then we'll... Just a, a very big picture question in that I think the centrifugal forces um, that have beset Nigeria mm. from the pre-independence constitution, which set up the regional tensions, the ethnic tensions, religious tensions. These are quite clear. But what is the glue that actually holds Nigeria together? Mm. And how durable is that glue? I know Boloshinka recently said he felt it was coming apart, that glue. What, what is it, and how durable do you think it is? OK, let's take some of this. I'm going to, put, Doctor, I'm going to ask you the radicalization, because this is something that we, we read um, that people say, oh, radical Muslims, it's terrorism, it's Al-Qaeda involved, all of this kind of stuff. What's your attitude on that? What's you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I can understand where you are coming from. I've been attacked and all of that. But I, I don't necessarily think that that will get us too far, blaming one side or the other, uh, in my view. Um, I said earlier that the house are full of angels. They are not your ordinary settler. Most of the settlers in Nigeria will understand them to be people who moved maybe in the 20, 1920s, 1930s. The house are full of most of them, Nguanrogo, which is at the core. Those were people who were conscripted by the native authority to go and work in the mines when the mines opened around night, very early in the colonial period. The indigenous populations, they are lived in scattered settlements. Those people, apart from the fact that they are the ones who were responsible for the labor and the tin industry also, they saw just come up from scratch. Now, that's different in the Nigerian system. Kano has been there for thousands of years. When the Igbos and the Yorubas go, uh, in the 1920s as so-called settlers. There's a limit to the claims they can make, even in terms of their own interaction. The Hausa and Jos feel that to some extent, they are part and parcel of the building of the place. The unfortunate thing is that that was also seen, I believe, in the 40s and 50s to give them the right to dominate the local people. And that was wrong. And somehow we have to find a way to break excessive claims and legitimate claims and respond to the legitimate ones. We haven't done that. Now, this particular crisis that started in, uh, over this local government, if my sources are correct, the so-called House of Fulani radicals, they went to the governor and said, we demand the deputy to the local government chairman. He refused. In the end, the, gov the governor had his own candidate and his own plans. The so-called House of Fulani ran with an, another indigenous... The House of Fulani was the, cha the chairmanship candidate. An indigenous person was his deputy. They have been trying to build bridges. And uh, not enough of that is going on. I think that's the way we should address this issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to, to Michael. Um, Halliburton, en bref. <laughs> Yes, indeed, a uh, murky business indeed. Thank you very much for that, Kay. Um, um, just the big picture for, 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 for those of you who don't know the case, um, Halliburton and, and some associated companies have actually um, confessed to um, uh, being um, part of a, um, uh, a plot to bribe um, or attempt to bribe Nigerian officials to win billions of dollars of work on a massive gas liquefaction plant in, in the Niger Delta, and um, um, allegedly about $150 or a million dollars or more of, of bribes were, were paid. Um, and um, there's all sorts of evidence that um, various sort of high-level people have, have been involved in, in, in Nigeria um, as, as re uh, bribe recipients of, over the years. Um, I'm slightly unsighted because I haven't actually seen the Sahara reporter's uh, story. Um, but um, 
certainly the uh, evidence which um, was it was uh, to just to give you one example there's a consultant called Jeffrey Tesla who is allegedly at the center of, of all of this and is allegedly this consultant who paid out bribes from this slush fund he's actually in the process of being extradited to the United States where he's been indicted over this um, uh, over this affair um, and um, Tesla in testimony to a French magistrate um, talked about meetings which took place involving the the last three heads of state of huh. Nigeria um, mm. at which um, this deal was was discussed um, and um, um, so, so that's that's out there and, and has been for some time I think this was this point was actually put to put a former president of us on a, hard a talk. BBC hard talk program and uh, yeah. he was not best pleased I think is the, <laughs> um, to, 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 to be confronted with this yeah. but so no, nothing has been proved but there's an awful lot of material out there mm. but of course um, who really in Nigeria is interested in investigating this properly I mean the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission looked at it but it was quite clear to me that um, while the, you know, there were some very good people who were working in that organization, there was, that this case was hugely political um, and, and that um, people were, were very reluctant to, to touch it for understandable reasons. I mean, in a sense, it was Nigeria's BAE systems almost um, in, in that it has that kind of political, um, um, those kind of political yeah. implications. Yeah. Okay. And, anyway, I'm sorry, so that's it, so yes. Okay, in a minute, I'm going to go round our panel asking them to tell us in one sentence What's the glue which holds Nigeria together? So you three can be thinking about that <laughs> while Jamila tells us about her the interview which has a service did with uh, Babangida. Right. Okay. Um, uh, s three days ago, we 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 um, we did an interview with General Babangida. General Babangida uh, was Nigeria's one of Nigeria's um, um, military ru rulers. Um, he was there before the late um, General Sani Abacha. And by the way, the, the Sahara reporters, right? Uh, the report they put out, somehow Babangida's name appears on that list. So um, amongst other people, amongst other very, very, very important people, including mm. the current national security advisor, right? So that, that, that is how bad things are. Like um, Mike said, um, nothing has been proven yet. However, you can understand some of the reasons as to why the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, that is the, the anti-corruption body, is sort of um, not sort of very willing, hesitant in touching that matter, right? Uh, Babangida, in our interview, in, in the BBC interview with Babangida, by the way, Babangida, left office um, 17 years ago and since then he went back to his uh, home state, Niger state, living the life of a private citizen, right? Um, but um, just a couple of weeks ago he decided to, um, you know, contest, make, make an announcement that he'd be contesting for the next elections. By the way, he did try to contest for the elections uh, some three years ago, uh, but um, he w he was fought very um, vigorously by uh, um, President Olusegun um, Obasanjo. So now that um, Umaru Eradua, who happens to be from the north, and is a very complex thing again, the PDP is Nigeria's ruling party. Now they have got this internal arrangement, internal political arrangement, in which <clears throat> Nigeria is divided into six geopolitical zones. Again, to prevent this whole notion of one ethnic group dominating the other. So if you have a president from, say, the north western region of Nigeria, the vice president would come from south-south Nigeria. That is what you have at the moment. President Umaru Er Adwa happens to be from northwest Nigeria. He's taken ill since November, and suddenly there is a possibility, there is an opening, an opportunity for other people from northern Nigeria to contest uh, the election. because. 
there are indications that President Umaru Er Adwa may actually not be coming back. Are uh, there? Yeah, there are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you know that. So, um, um, President Babang, ex military leader Babangida, makes his announcement that he will be contested. So, BBC got this interview with him and we put it to him. Look, tell us exactly why, obviously, you want to run for elections. And he goes, he, by the way, he's known as Maradona, right? That's the mm. name people call him, Maradona. Very cunning fellow. He never answers the questions. And he went on the BBC to say that, indeed, the elections he annulled, because, again, it's another thing, if you go back to history, he very infamously annulled elections that were seen to be uh, the most, the, the fairest elections in the history of democracy in Nigeria, in which uh, the late Moshud Abiola uh, won the election. Um, the BBC pre producer and presenter asked him, why did you, I mean, did you annul the elections? Yes, I did. It was the fairest election. Well, why did you annul it? Well, you know, that's, that should, we should save that for another time. He didn't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a long story, but w when next we meet, we will answer that question. <laughs> then the next question, um, well, why exactly do you want to come back? You know, look, look at America. Look at all of the parts of the world. Young people, you know, are coming to contest. Don't you think you have gone past your time? You should allow the younger generation to contest, perhaps they've got ideas as to how to move Nigeria forward. And Babangida says, no, actually, we have tried to give the young people an opportunity, but they have failed. They have demonstrated to the rest of the world to us that they, they, they are not able to do it. They are incompetent. <laughs> and unfortunately, that was what got him. Gives a new meaning to the word chutzpah, that, doesn't mm, it? <laughs> indeed. So that was what got him. And, and the reaction you got? The reaction was, was uh, probably, you better say, uh, Lindsay, because you've actually seen some of those. Well, I mean, just, I mean, what is it, 70% of Nigerians are under 40? And this yes. guy wants them to elect him, and he says they're incompetent? <laughs> More than 70 million Nigerians are under the age of 40. They, are, they obviously <laughs> constitute the huge bulk of the, of the voters, and he has basically alienated himself from, from this. Yeah. Okay. What's the glue that holds Nigeria together? Sorry, that's me. So we go around I'd this say it was the same glue that holds every African country together. The fact that we have a shared history in boundaries that cut across tribal, you know, lines. It's something that we were handed and we've had to live with. And okay. we have integra integrated economies and we have to somehow make it work. What's the glue that holds mm. Nigeria together? The army. The army. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idealistic and the non-idealistic version. Anybody who wants to break away, we have to get past the army. That's one. Yes. Oil. Oil. That's another one. You lose your place at the trough if you're a pig, or you lose your fair share if you're an honest citizen. But over and above that, none of the challenges to the Nigerian state realistically has a chance. They don't. Uh, the balance of power or the equation mm. doesn't, doesn't favor them. So it's, those are the three factors. We'll come this way, because what's the glue that holds Nigeria together? Well, a uh, Nigerian journalist once described the country as, uh, a, a, rather nicely, as a, a, a bad marriage that nobody wants to leave for fear of losing a share of the spoils. But <laughs> I, 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 I guess I've, I've come to see it more as a blind date that hasn't gone very well, but it might still be better than the other possibilities out yeah. there. Very good. What's the glue that holds Nigeria together? I, I think it's, it's just sheer good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, and there you are. <laughs> okay, we've got, a little, we've got a bit more time, so we're going to take a few more. And uh, yes, gentlemen at the back. We'll take two gentlemen at the back. And no one, this lady, I'm not, I haven't forgotten you. I had forgotten you, but I haven't forgotten you now. I'm going to take this gentleman, this gentleman, and that lady. Yeah. Hi, Professor Leifonar from King's College London. Just wanted to follow up with Michael about oil in the Delta, especially looking at it from the medium to long term business priorities of the oil majors. They're significant players. Things aren't going well for them. They're losing a lot of barrels. There's bunkering. There's smuggling. Amnesty releases the reports about how much they're messing up the environment. They're getting dragged into courts in America, UK. You said the ceasefire is holding, but no one would be surprised if a flow station started getting blown up again or kidnapping started again. 
things don't look good for them now. They're significant actors in the Nigerian political scene. What do they want in the medium to long term? And what kinds of pressures are they going to be putting on the political system to get what they want? You mean the oil majors, what do they want? What do the oil majors want? want? Okay, right, there was a gentleman there in the purple, and then we're going to the lady here. Um, I'm nobody. <laughs> no, you are somebody, <laughs> sir. You are I'm somebody. Going, I'm going to make a comment anyway. I was just, I was going to comment, there's a lot of, I mean, with regards to the issue of indigents and settlers, I think that what people have sort of left out is the fact that there aren't a lot of um, huge metropolises in Nigeria. You have Lagos and perhaps Jos and Abuja, where you have a fusion of peoples from all over the country. But for the most part, most of the capital cities, for example, in Oweri, in Imo State, or in, uh, uh, in Umwahe, in Abia State, you have a concentration of people who would consider themselves indigents, even if not in the classical sense, as you mentioned, even if not in the sense that they've been there forever. But if you go to you know, the majority of the bigger cities or townships in Nigeria, for instance, in the East, you have mostly Igbo-speaking people. And whatever the, the accepted local dialect is there, you would have people who would be able to say, OK, I'm Igbo, thus I'm from Oweri, and you, you can check my background. So in that light, you know, if you were to sort of try to Im envision a situation where a Yoruba man, for instance, went to my home state, because I'm Igbo, and decided he wanted to run for, for governor or whatever other political office, there would be a little bit of, of a brouhaha for him because he wouldn't be accepted, right? So, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's less a case of the, the system foisting this, this situation on Nigerians, and more a case of what would you accept as a person? You know, I'm, I'm Igbo, I'm from Abia. I grew up in Lagos, but at the end of the day, I still go back every yeah. Christmas, and so what would I accept in my home state? So I think that perhaps is what needs to be focused on. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, lady here, um, she'll put her hand up and take the microphone. Yes. Um, I had two comments, really. The first was around the issue of indigents and settlers. And I just wondered whether the panel had any kind of ideas about the minority groups, actually, the smaller ethnic groups, which this whole idea was sort of created to protect. It's not protecting Yoruba people or Igbo people or House of Fulani people. It's the tiny, tiny Tiv groups and the Ijaws, those people that, get, that will be overwhelmed by thus bigger tribes that kind of come over to take that. And my second question was really around sort of looking forward for Nigeria. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have kind of commented about leadership and I always find that that's quite, um, not to be rude, I think that's quite a lazy comment actually. I don't <laughs> think Nigeria's problem is one of leadership. I think it's one of Nigerian citizens who are not taking responsibility for the corruption mm. that happens in daily lives. And that feeds up to our leaders because we think it's okay to bribe our police officers. We think it's okay to do all these small acts of violence and corruption. And therefore our country is corrupt and violent, but it's not about our leaders, it's about how we look forward mm -hmm. to change our attitude towards that. Okay, taking responsibility, good point. Um, let me, um, briefly, Michael, what do the oil majors want? I presume they want to make money. That's what they always want. <laughs> uh, that, 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 may, that may not be uh, alien to them, I think, <laughs> so to say. Um, they, well, they want trouble-free oil, um, obviously. Um, I mean, I think that this is um, a banal thing to say, but, but maybe the reasoning is less banal. Um, it's a very dangerous time for, for oil in Nigeria because, um, apart from all the violence, um, and pollution and everything that has fed into that that we all know about. Um, the Nigerian oil has become a kind of microcosm for changes in geopolitical power, um, big Chinese interests coming in, um, Gazprom from Russia, Indian interests as well. And I think um, the real danger is the combination of that with um, the, um, the, 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 um, the government's desire to respond to militancy and to crush it um, could lead to a kind of race to the bottom where uh, military solutions um, are, um, are, 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 are even are, are become in even more used than they are at the moment. Obviously, there was a taste of that in, in May last year. Um, and also, it could be a big problem from a corruption point of view, this, this kind of race to the bottom with um, uh, so, so many um, different um, um, companies from different countries in, in interested in the oil. I mean, the Western majors, yes, they still produce the majority of the oil. They are still the, the biggest players. Um, they've been fighting with the government over royalties um, and, and, and who gets what share of the, 
the pie. Um, but it's now a much bigger story than just the Western majors, I think. And, and that's, the, that's the sort of big picture mm. take that, 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 that I would use on it. Um, just what, a one line comment. Um, I mean, we've been talking a lot about how um, uh, the, 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 the Nigerian constitution has been creating new opportunities for, for conflict. The oil industry in a sort of parallel process has also yeah. done its share of this by, for example, a classic problem is you get um, fights between um, communities which are near oil installations have been designated so-called host communities um, and, and, and get, um, get money, get um, infrastructure, and speedboats and stuff, and communities next door which get nothing. Mm. Now, that starts fights um, and between people who were not fighting before. So the oil has been another factor which has provided not only conflict but new lines in this complex country along which a conflict can take place. Mm. So um, I'm interested in this issue of two points. So the protecting the minority groups and also, I mean, explaining, I think, very well um, how some of this law about these laws about the androgenes actually work. I mean, what, is there, do these two people have a point? Uh, in many respects, I think they convey the anxiety that certain groups in the country feel when these issues are discussed. Uh, the Eurobus, for instance, 16 to 20 million, very vibrant literature, they have uh, newspapers. If you left indigenous languages to develop themselves, the Yorubas have no problem. They produce maybe 20, 25 uh, video films, these Nollywood films, every month. This, mm -hmm. You can't say the same for the TV. Or, mm -hmm. And the TV are a major group, not to talk of others further down the line. They, if you leave things to open competition, those ones will never get a any opportunity whatsoever. But how do you ensure that you, are, you, you create access for such people and then you, you do it in a way that does not destroy the social fabric? I think that's the Nigerian uh, dilemma. Mm. And in many respects, there the are two questions do, do reflect. Uh, yeah, that's the essence of the, of the problem there. Mm -hmm. It's not um, the leaders, it's the people. Yeah, I mean, people can change their habits, but eventually, no matter how many people try and change those habits, it has to be changed at the top for it to trickle down effectively. The whole institution has to be changed. The way the things function have to be changed. And I think that's, yes, we all have our individual responsibilities. I think that's a fact of life. But there has to be some kind of honesty at the top. And just on a point that Fred uh, brought up, and it came back when you mentioned the army, as part of the glue. One of the worrying things about Plateau State is that there are increasing stories of the army being compromised and fragmenting a po into, um, along religious lines, yes. and of the army actually sh doing extrajudicial killings. So that glue, that's that national institution, which is one of the strongest and, and, and the most important, mm. is if, if it's the glue, then we're in serious trouble. Mm. People are now arming themselves because they fear the army. And even yesterday, some people who were security guards were shot dead by the army when they were guarding an, an area. And that was done on religious lines. So that is one of the things that is most worrying about Plateau State. And it's one of the reasons why this issue has to be resolved as a matter of urgency. No matter whether there's an election coming up or not, I think uh, leaders with imagination would actually seize this and, and really... Yeah. You know, do you want to say anything on that, Jimena? No, I mean, 350 ethnic groups um, in Nigeria, um, I mean, they all, I suppose, have to find a way of um, accepting one another. Mm -hmm. uh, but of these more than 350 ethnic groups, you, you have not more than um, perhaps 10, you know, that tend to dominate the, the rest, which is exactly what, what you were talking about. But I suppose one issue that we probably have not actually talked about uh, in great length this evening is, is the issue of, of, of deep poverty. You know, Nigeria is, I think, the seventh largest oil producing uh, country in the world and, and sixth, yeah? I thought Angola was the sixth, but. Okay, now they are the sixth. <laughs> Thank God for. So we've actually overtaken Angola now. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> we took the money there. So, no, but, but the, the, the point is there, there is there is abject poverty. Poverty. What do you do uh, in a country in which 
of the more than 400 and 140 million, at least 98% of those live under probably two or three dollars um, a day. You have, uh, I think, about 43% living under one dollar a day. How do you do it? Whereas on the other hand, you have uh, you know, a few individuals who, um, and I'm not calling any names, this a politician who at the moment, as I'm sitting here, um, is one of the people that is said to be preparing to run for the elections in 2011, who was actually um, investigated a couple of uh, months ago at, at the United States um, Senate, and apparently, uh, you know, more than $600 million <coughs> is stashed away somewhere in America, and they actually don't know what to do with that money. So that, that, that is mm. the, the, the tragedy of Nigeria. Mm. You know, what do we do with, 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 with such a country? How do we get Nigeria on, on its feet? Um, someone says to me, Jamila, Nigeria is like Humpty Dumpty. Yes, indeed. Nigeria is, is, um, is, is a Humpty Dumpty, which um, hopefully, we, we hope it won't have the great fall. Um, but, but frankly, uh, the picture is grim. Mm -hmm. But um, we will continue exactly. to see how to find ways out. OK, I'm going to take a few more questions before we wind up. And um, I can see two back there. There's a gentleman, and then there's a lady behind him. So we'll take those two. And then I see you, sir. Yeah. I've got the microphone. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, I've, I've followed uh, intensely everything that people have said. Hey, uh, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, my name's Struan Simpson. Um, from St. James's Research. Uh, my association with Nigeria goes back to 1964. Um, the last engagement was doing some, uh, some, some conflict impact assessment uh, for the European Union to advise them on what factors would, uh, would get in the way of implementing their 30 million uh, euro program. And the factor that got in the way was, was the, the uh, total inability to reach the poorest in society. Right. There's always a barrier. There's always a barrier of those people who have already got something. Mm. They're not, they're not um, get-rich-quick merchants. But the, but the competition for resources is so intense mm. that e e even, you know, even uh, uh, a margin of 1% is enough to set, uh, <coughs> uh, to set a conflict alight. Okay. That's um, Can I move on? Because we're yeah, going I just to want to say, say one more thing. Yeah. And that is that I believe that the glue that holds Nigeria together right now is the diaspora. Okay. Oh, that's a very interesting thing to say in this uh, uh, lady behind, yes. Hi, um, my name is Lizzie Maudsley. I currently work for Christian Solidarity Worldwide as well. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, political and ethnic um, unrest and discontent, but I think we've been skirting around the issue that actually religion is a powerful othering um, factor in almost well, all societies, and I think we forget that um, in most of the world, religion isn't quite so individualistic as it is um, here. And looking at the conflicts, um, last month, most of the casualties were not political figures. They were from small villages, mostly women and children. Mm -hmm. These were not political targets. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's something that we should... Um, observe and I think we should talk about religious um, conflict seriously. Right. Okay, the role of religion in conflict. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen, there. Uh, good evening. Um, I happen to uh, live and work in the uh, Niger Delta and um, it's really good, good to hear what's been said about that area. Um, one thing that I find very interesting, uh, and I'd love to hear your uh, your esteemed comments, is um, 
when I drive around and I we look, we look at the projects, there's a lot of organisations who are doing some excellent work there. Not necessarily at the scale of the EU with uh, you know 30 million euros. That's a lot of money, but there's lots of other organisations who are doing some good stuff there. Um, there's all sorts of things like the Niger Delta Watch. I imagine no no pun intended, but frontline SMS organisations like that who can get a lot of information out. And I just wondered. Um, the key thing I see, I see an incredible amount of energy and positive things on a daily basis. People are just getting on with their lives. And I think uh, most of my, um, most of the people who live in the same city as me in Port Alcott would, be, would feel quite patronized to be here today just because they're just getting on with their lives and trying to achieve. And from a leadership point of view, I just wonder, do you actually think whether you're an LGA guy trying to fight for either PDP or the ANC or, or whether you're hustling to become the next governor or whether you're trying to be a minister or whatever. Do you think from head to toe that there's the actual capacity to um, deal with what's really important when it comes to people not killing themselves, which is basically, mm. do I have a fair crack at the whip at housing? Um, do I have a fair crack at the whip at getting a job because I've got the, the qualifications to do it? Do I have a right. fair crack at the whip at so is, no, you mean, uh, well, I'm trying to answer the question whether, whether there's any kind of meritocracy at is, all. Is there the, do, in your opinion, do you think there's the actual capacity within the leadership to simply do what maybe Qatar may have done when they struck it lucky about 10 years right. ago? So is there capacity within the Nigerian leadership to transform the country? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the uh, front here. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Susan Shulman. I'm a photojournalist. Yes. And my question, um, I would like you to please clarify a little bit what you see as your, is the army and the security forces involvement in Jos, because I, mm. I know you've said that it's along religious lines, but I was there. I covered the first round, the January rounds, um, and it was clear both that they were indicted on the level of the government in that they're the people who are responsible not just for this, but in wider in a broader sense and over a greater period of incident, they're not ever taken to task. They were also indicted as um, directly, you know, shooting the population. And that was, they were the Muslim population I was speaking to and they were attacked by the, um, the military who were, when I was there, wearing British camouflage uniforms mm -hmm. to distinguish themselves from frauds. But nonetheless, the few children who I saw in what was basically a ghost town, the center part of Joss, which was flattened, um, fled when they saw the soldier who was accompanying me and showing him, showing me the way. So I think I'd like to have a little more explanation on mm. what you see as going on there. With the role of the military. The role Rangers, of the military, the military and forces. Okay, let me move these around a bit. Um, Michael, let me ask you about the religious, um, Religion is a as a powerful factor. From your experience as an outsider living and working in Jos, uh, not Jos, in Nigeria in general, how how did you see religion playing a role in life and in politics? Oh well, it, it's massive, and and um, and I certainly didn't mean to su suggest that religion wasn't very very important. And um, I mean, one of my most memorable experiences living in Nigeria was going to a an all-night church service on the uh, Ibadan Expressway um, on, on one Friday night, and just the sheer size of this, you know, this aircraft hangar-like building, tens of thousands of, of people um, enraptured was, uh, was extraordinary. Um, and um, you know, there, there clearly is a, a, a great sort of intensity, a great social role um, that, that religion plays. Um, and I think that um, you talked about the role of religion as, as create, in creating a sense of otherness. And um, obviously that's right. And I, I've said at the start, you know, it would be absurd to ignore it. All, but what I was trying to say was, um, and I think all the speakers, I think we all agree on this, there's more to it than that. Um, and that religion, certainly in my experience, the time I was there, was often exploited really quite cynically um, by uh, Muslims and Christians, um, particularly when they held political power. You know, question the whole imposition of of harsh um, uh, um, uh, Sharia law punishments in some northern states. Now, to what extent was that about religious belief? To what extent was that a political act? Um, um, and and so so 
clearly, you know, there's a, there's a complex picture there. And you, so even when you're talking about religion, you're not talking about religion alone. The same way we talk about corruption, um, I'm sorry to say it, but, you know, there were pastors who um, I came across uh, in Lagos who, you know, on the face of it, and people I trusted told me were incredibly corrupt and completely abused their positions. So um, I think that, um, in, in, in summary, it's, it's obviously a huge influence, but it's a sophisticated one. And, and I think the very things that we've talked about there reflect the fact that religion cuts across other areas of life and vice versa. And you've got to consider everything together. You can't just take religion out in that way. OK, Camilla, let me put to you the, the, the last business question about the role of the army in, in Joss. What's your understanding of the role of the army in Joss in perpetrating killings, in stopping killings? in preventing killings? No, this is very similar to what uh, Michael has said. If I may probably s sort of rewind to the uh, religious, um, religion sort mm. of role, the role of religions. Let me say something here. Religion is ni in Nigeria is, is big business, OK? It's huge. It's massive, right? And, and believe me, both sides are exploiting it. Uh, the more followers you have, the more influential you are, right? And even the political leaders, uh, depending on which um, um, re religious um, leader, you know, church or mosque he goes to, can secure votes. That is what it is. Religion has been exploited. Religion has been bastardized. Religion has been subverted. That is what it's about. And unfortunately, the reality is, in all the killings that have happened since Nigeria's return to democracy, we have never seen the son of a pastor or the son of an imam who's been killed. It's, it's always the poor people. So when, uh, when, 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 when the elephants fight, the grass does suffer. That is what it is. Coming to the issue of the role of the military, again, exploitation, again, bastardization, subversion, and corruption. What I can testify to is you can buy a military camouflage in Nigeria. You can buy it. And a lot of people who wear the military uniform are not real military people. A lot of people who, wear, who have guns, AK-47s or whatever you call them, they are, they, are not, they are not military people. So that is the reality. What is the security? Um, um, what are the security operatives in Nigeria going to do in terms of weeding out the fake military officials that parade the streets of Plateau and indeed the Niger Delta and all the parts of Nigeria? <laughs> and it's not just the military. It also include, includes the police. I remember in 2004, when we went to cover the crisis in Plateau in Yelwan Shandam, right? It was the same accusation that we have today, uh, you know, the same accusations that is being labeled against the military that you had, you know, you know uh, labeled against the, the police in Yelwan Shandam. And that was the crisis which, because we, the BBC and other international organizations, had very forcefully reported. Right, made President Obasanjo then to impose the state of emergency in Plateau. Okay, can either of you two oh, okay. um, yeah, say anything make, about yeah. the role of the uh, the military? Um, Did you? Yeah, um, sure, I can say a lot. I think um, you're right. There have been accusations of fake soldiers. However, what's worrying now is that people are thinking these aren't fake soldiers anymore, and this feeling has been increasing in Plateau State, particularly this year, that this is actually the work of rogue elements within the army. And the main reason for that feeling is that the general officer commanding, who is now in charge, overall charge of security in Plateau State, has been um, seen at the scenes of extrajudicial shooting, has been accused also of holding back um, Christian youths and allowing Muslim youths to, to um, loot and has been sort of almost, the question, there's a lot of questioning of the fact there have been so many security lapses under him. Why is he still in, in, in office? I think if you want to, to reinstate um, people's faith in the army, this man has to be suspended 
pending ex investigation into these accusations. If he's found innocent, fine, bring him back. But as long as he's there, this whole feeling that the army is not the army that it was. You know, this is the army that was well respected for international peacekeeping, for being the, as you said, the glue that holds Nigeria together. That is rapidly diminishing. And <laughs> something has to be done before this, this main um, national institution is actually completely loses its reputation. Do you want to come back on that? No, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, and again, it, 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 it goes to this, it, it applies to the same um, security <coughs> operatives who were sent to quell the crisis of Boko Haram in, in Borno State. Oh, yes, the so, uh, so the point I'm making here is, yes, indeed, they, 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 even the military, there is mm. a lot of politicization of the military itself. And again, this issue of Muslim, non-Muslim, Hausa, non-Hausa, indigenous and non-indigenous mm. has found its way into, into the, the Nigerian okay. security yes. operatives, and, and which is something that needs to be checked And another well. thing that you said was that you never see a pastor's son being killed. Well, I would um, absolutely say that you were wrong in that. We have heard of deaths of pastors and their entire families mm. being targeted and killed. Even during 2008, when it was supposed to be about an election, there was no attack on a political party. There was no attack, as it was said earlier, on, a, on, on anything to do with politics. The main initial attacks were on the houses of pastors. And in the report that I got yesterday, in the same area where the former head of um, the cocaine church was uh, murdered several years ago, this attack has been renewed in this area. He was killed along with his daughter-in-law and, and his grandchild. Okay, so fine. they are dying. Okay. As a result. So before we come to the doctor for the other two questions, I'm going to go to our substitute who has just put his hand up. So have we, where's the... I'd like to respond to that last allegation against uh, uh, MENA, the mm -hmm. GOC of uh, the Just Division. Yes. Can you speak of it, Yuka? Sure. I'd like, to, I like to address that last yes. issue about MENA. Mm -hmm. I think what one of the biggest problems is not going to the truth of the matters and, 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 and uh, talking with hearsay. I'm not talking with you. No, 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 I'm yeah, not yeah, saying yeah, that you yeah. are. Let's but let's but I think what happened was that Jang, the governor of Plateau State, mm -hmm. and Domkat Bali, another a previous uh, retired general, were the one main uh, sources of that allegation against mm -hmm. Maina. And Jang himself, the governor, has been proven to be a liar because he made allegations that he told Maina the day before that the attacks were going to occur. He actually made that pub statement in public, and then it was later found, he later retracted the statements that he, as a sitting governor, made against a, a professional soldier that had not, that has had nothing to his, against his record to show any kind of, a, any kind of a, a, a sectionalism like this. Mm -hmm. And the, the, this is a symptom, I think, of the personalization mm. of, of, of the, the personal issues becoming generalized. Dom Kat Bali and Jonah, and Jonah Jang were both in the military in 1992 and were retired by yep. Babangida. Yep. Babangida replaced uh, 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 Jang with Abacha. Mena is Abacha, was Abacha's ADC at yep. the time. So it's a carryover of latent hostilities Politics. to the previous situation. And we're all buying and running with those allegations made by this discredited mm. Okay, so I don't, I mean, no, no, <laughs> I not, okay. Jang, I don't want you, to get into, right, meeting, I don't want to get into all this ingenuity because we're going to finish here. But what I'm going to do, finally, I'm going to turn to the doctor, I'm going to put those two points which were there. Re the barriers to reaching the poorest. Why do the poorest remain so poor in Nigeria? Mm. And the question from the gentleman over there, does the government have the capacity to turn the situation around? I think with respect to the capacity, what people are thinking of increasingly is to go to the level of state governments rather than the federal government. And some state governments are beginning to show promise in this respect. So I believe either as individual Nigerians or members of the international community, uh, if we target particular areas that show promise, uh, that may be a model that would uh, maybe generate replication across the board or shame the laggards uh, to kind of pick up their act. And I think in that respect, some governors are beginning to show promise uh, already. 
uh, but at the national level as a whole, mm -hmm. I don't see any resolution of the political logjam until mm -hmm. well after 2011. Mm -hmm. When Nigerian politicians talk of their capacity, is to cut deals and uh, horse trade, mm -hmm. not to develop any agenda for anything. And the poor? Uh, well, the poor, the structure of governance and everything in that country, they are structurally jammed below. Getting to them is extremely difficult uh, with the best of uh, resources and intention. Mm. But can I? Uh, it's a, no, sorry, I don't, I'm sorry, we're, we're uh, sorry about this, but we are coming to nine o'clock, so I'm going to leave the gentleman, but then people can come and you know, attack the guests up. <laughs> no, I mean, come and ask the guests more questions. Yeah, can, can just, just, yeah, so just about yeah. the army. You see, this is not the first time the Nigerian army is killing its citizens. Mm. And neither is it the first time the army is killing its own members. I think what uh, Deepa was saying about the... I the, don't want to get into the different yeah, names okay. and so on. The problem okay. with injustice is insecurity. Mm. Yeah. People feel threatened they are arming themselves. And in this context, you need a certain level of impartial authority mm. to, to guarantee mm. their security and separate them. The army has not been able to do that. But all the allegations and counter-allegations, in my view, uh, responding to you directly, none of them has substance. What the governor said... Don't get into what the no. governor said. ...hasn't been proven. <laughs> because I'm not dealing with the governor. No, wait, yes. I, okay. So all, because, the, all the allegations yeah, have not been proven. But, the point, but I think that the general point mm. is the one to end on, which is that the people of Joss feel insecure. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As Absolutely. gentlemen here said, yeah, there is a danger of people, people arming themselves. Yeah. And that is what we fear and that is what we hope that somehow or other Nigeria will be able to rescue itself from. So it just leaves me now to thank you all very much for, for coming and to thank our guests and panelists who have answered very, very difficult questions.